Fair but they're, so they're tracking a lot of data and, and just basically modeling what's coming next. Mm, that makes sense. So I know we mentioned clinical trials. I don't know, Chris, you're currently writing a book about those, <laughs> about those <laughs> clinical trials uh, to try and explain to uh, people who have no idea what, what it is or how simple it is uh, from what you've told me, how simple it is to, to actually sure. join one. Um, you want to kind of run down uh, how a clinical trial works and how if for whatever reason somebody listening has somebody a relative or whatever that is considering it um how they would go about joining one sure yeah do you mind if i give a shameless plug go for it <laughs> that, that's what that's what we're here for only if it's a shameful plug <laughs> yeah, yeah. I figured you were... <laughs> so the book is called um so the book the title of the book is what the heck is a clinical trial and I'm writing it, you know, as, as somebody who's been both in the academic field and in industry cancer research. And when is I've it been supposed in to get released? September. Nice. September. <laughs> yeah. um, Be on the lookout for it this fall. What the heck is a clinical trial? All right, yeah. keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the idea is this, that, that um, there are a ton of oncology clinical trials. Especially, you know, the book focuses in the United States, but the United States only makes up something like 30% of the recruitment. Um, so, I mean, it's worldwide. So with the advent of sort of these immunotherapies and a variety of different um, kind of clinical applications to cancer therapy, there are just tons and tons of clinical trials. And the truth is nobody knows about them. That's really what it comes down to is that the public just doesn't know that they're out there, right? So I pulled up like some fun statistics here fun with a question mark. Um, so there's roughly seven, like 1.7 million new cancer diagnoses annually, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the number of clinical trial spots, there's effectively about every year at this point, there's about one spot for every 10 patients. So mm -hmm. there's a ton of spots out there that people just don't know about. And so, you know, when there's a couple of surveys out there if anybody who's listening to this is looking for a really good site to get some information on this stuff the center for information and study of clinical tr clinical research participation so c i s c r p is a nonprofit organization we that does will a lot put that state. link in the description so no need yeah. to memorize that <laughs> <laughs> yeah check those guys out they do a lot of work with people who have already participated in clinical trials and so what they do is they just check with people who've taken them and do a bunch of survey research. So to give it people an idea, let me find this stat because it's kind of a crazy statistic here. So yeah, so in the United States, right? Let's see, there are, as of July, because I just updated this statistic, there are 14,000 McDonald's operating in the United States, which as it turns out, thank you internet, means that if you're in the continuous 48 states, you can never be more than 135 miles from a McDonald's. So <laughs> there are more ongoing recruiting clinical trials today than that. Now, when you only go to cancer, there's about 7,000, right? So there's basically one cancer clinical trial for every two McDonald's. Now, can anybody here not think of 10 McDonald's off the top of their head? There are oh, did we lose everywhere. So that is. gives you an idea. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. This is my new sole unit of measurement. Everything's yeah. going to be compared to the national number of McDonald's. <laughs> so I, I actually did this. There's more cancer clinical trials than Taco Bells or Burger Kings. Oh. So but we stuck with McDonald's, uh, you know, the fries. They really just get me. So, yeah, so they're, they're everywhere, right? And there's a ton of them. And the truth is, it is super easy to get onto one. It's basically an email. And you can be on a clinical trial. I mean, you'll get checked out for eligibility criteria. And there's a number of patients who end up not being eligible. Um, but for patients who have gone through their normal clinical course, about half of them, I think it was in this, in this like trial that they were reporting, 62% of patients said their clinicians never mentioned the words clinical trials or clinical research. Mm -hmm. Their doctor never talked about it. And uh, basically, it looks like when you sort of poll people, that's who people want to hear from. They want to hear from their doctor about a clinical trial or the research staff associated with one. But you're more likely to find it on TV or a newspaper than from your doctor. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, whole, there's a big gap in the knowledge of what these things are. 
And so really, I mean, my, my take home point here is that they're kind of everywhere. And the guys over at that, the Center for Information and Study of Clinical Research Participation, they'll go so far as to search for you for a clinical trial and they'll send you a list for free. Um, and then all you have to do is send somebody an email. So it's really straightforward. And the, the idea of writing this book was, you know, I've had a couple of conversations with people who have had cancer, right? So it kind of comes with the territory. You work in a, in a sciencey field, mm -hmm. somebody you know gets cancer, you get a phone call, at which point I'm sure you guys have all had to state, I'm not a medical doctor, mm -hmm. like multiple times. Um, but not, not that kind of doctor. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> That's very true, um, actually. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but we're all associated with this medical clinical research complex. And so we all kind of know that these things are going on. Um, and so what I thought was, hey, I should just write all this stuff down um, mm -hmm. and give it to people. And, you know, I'm going to self-publish it on Amazon. It's going to be super cheap. It's going to be, you know, a couple bucks um, just so that people can kind of look at it. And all it does is it walks through all those statistics, all the kind of the fun statistics about McDonald's and, you know, how many clinical trials are out there. I think there's roughly in every state in the United States, there's over 100 clinical trials for cancer right now, except for Wyoming, which I think has 97. So, I mean, they're everywhere, right? So as long as you're willing to drive within your own state, you've got a lot of options. Yeah. Um, and so really what I wanted to do is just walk people through, okay, here's what a clinical trial is. Here's what the different phases are, right? Because that's important too. Mm -hmm. um, what are you joining when you join a clinical trial? What does it mean if the clinical trial is blinded or masked? You know, what does it mean if there's a placebo group? Is there a placebo group? Is that really mm -hmm. a thing in cancer trials anymore? Yeah. You know, what's standard of care therapy? So there's a whole, I mean, it's basically just a glossary that I tried to make really easy to read. Um, easier than talking to me at least. And so <laughs> it's really just a chance for patients who are going through this. You know, this is a super emotional time for people, right? You, you walk into your doctor's office. For most patients, this is what happens, right? You get cancer, which is already bad enough, right? I don't have to understate that. You go through the course of therapy, right? So there's a bunch of standard therapies. You go through all those. And then your cancer progresses after that. And your doctor goes, mm -hmm. uh, And so now you're just thrown into an arena that, I mean, now you can think about, you have other options on the table, right? You can think about hospice or you can think about trying these experimental therapies. But I, I mean, I, I personally would be unable to pick anything in anybody else's job. If you dropped me in anyone else's job and said, hey, make a decision for this company, that would be a terrible idea, <laughs> right? Like, also bet your life savings on it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's just unfair. So the goal here is just to kind of give people a quick, you know, it's like 75 pages. It's a small book. It'll bring you up to speed on the different types of clinical trials, on the different readouts that people are using. So, mm -hmm. you know, what does overall response rate mean? What's mm -hmm. a complete response? What's a partial response? What's stable disease? These, all, these things all have specific definitions. And the, the last goal of it is to help people bridge the gap between two, so between two individuals who have different levels of expertise, right? So we've all run into this scenario. We kind of jokingly ran into it earlier where the three of us started talking about T cells and we could go in on proteins and we're talking about PD-1, right? We all have a background and a filter that we can apply because we've all looked at this stuff for 15 years combined between <laughs> us, right? We have a filter that we can use to, to assess each other's statements. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when a doctor says, I, so I use in the book, when your dentist says, you'll feel a little bit of pressure, right? Does that really mean you're going to feel a little bit of pressure? No, right? That means it's going to hurt. But we all know that because we've gone to the dentist a bunch of times. The people who are going into clinical trials have never, this is their first, you know, their first rodeo. Yeah. And so when a doctor tells them, hey, I see, I've seen good results with this mm -hmm. in some patients I've treated. What does that mean, right? I mean, it, is this, a lot of doctors are older. Are they referencing the chemotherapy days where they're like, yeah, I mean, you know, 5% of patients responded and this new one, we're up to 10%. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's good in comparison, but, but they have a filter that normal people don't have. And there's a lot of crossover of words that people are using, right? The, the response is moderate. What does moderate mean? What does mild mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so the book kind of walks through all of those and says, look, this is the doctor filter that they're using on all these things. And so that's how you should filter it to your, to your everyday life and, and to learn what you're looking at. So that's why I wrote it. 
And the, the real shortest take home message for anybody who finds himself in this scenario is go check out those book. guys, the center for information <laughs> read and the read the book <laughs> and go, yeah. And try to get into a phase mm -hmm. three trial. It, it, the truth is it doesn't really matter what, if you're faced with a phase one, phase two or phase three, it doesn't really matter what they're testing. Mm -hmm. Take the phase three. Because statistically speaking, this is just from a risk management assessment, 97% of things in phase one will end up failing versus 30% of things in phase three that will end up succeeding. Mm -hmm. So if you get the option, go with a phase three. And yeah. then do a 60 second run through of the phases, kind of what their basic criteria they're trying to assess is. Sure. So the, so phase one, that's the other thing I, I want people to, to understand in the book, right? So when, when you're walking into a phase one clinical trial, so not all phase, not all clinical trials are created equal, right? That's really the take home. Phase one clinical trials, you're just testing if this is going to kill anybody mm -hmm. like, I, and, and whatever, you know, there's a variety of other side effects that it can have, but you're really just checking, is this going to hurt somebody when I put it in them? Um, and if it happens to work, that's, it's like a bonus, but the goal is to check whether you're going to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. And so you, you dose it accordingly, right? There's a lot of drugs that for most people in a phase one clinical trial, they'll end up taking the wrong dose mm -hmm. of what will eventually become the correct. So assume a drug is going to work, right? Most people on the phase one clinical trial will end up taking the wrong dose. Either it'll be too high or too low mm -hmm. because the phase one is looking for the right dose. How much can we give until somebody starts to be hurt? Um, phase two, you start to mix safety and efficacy. So you're looking for, things that happen more rare. So the more rare side effects will show up in a phase two. And you've generally picked a dose. So now you're looking for whether or not the drug works. And by phase three at the broadest level, you're checking whether the drug is better than an alternative. So mm -hmm. most patients in this scenario would get radiation. Is my drug better than radiation? That's the question being asked in the phase three. Um, so that's the broad breakdown. So even from that general definition, if you get an option of a phase one, two, or three, it makes the most sense to go for the phase three. Definitely. Mm -hmm.